Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Royalty Now, where we bring you face to face with figures from the past. Joan of Arc is an almost mythical figure. She's become a symbol of French freedom, leading men into battle and crowning kings, all before the age of 20. After we talk about her history, we'll get you closer to Joan of Arc than ever before by revealing our recreations of what she may have looked like. So let's go ahead and get started. Joan of Arc was born around 1412 in what is now Domremy, France, to her mother, Isabelle Romé, and her father, Jacques d'Arc. Her father was a landowning farmer and village official, and her mother was responsible for her family's education. Isabel would teach her children about bravery and deep piety. It's said that her mother's last name, Romé, had been earned by taking a long pilgrimage on foot from France to Rome and the Vatican City. This dedication would be passed on to Joan, and from a very early age, she was passionately religious, and her faith would only grow as she got older. Now, to call France in the early 15th century an unstable place to live would be a massive understatement. At the time of Joan's birth, war had been raging in Europe for almost a century. There was not anyone alive that had known a time of peace. What is now called the Hundred Years' War began in 1337, when the English king, Edward III, illegitimately laid claim to his uncle, Charles IV's French throne, and named himself the King of France. The ensuing war would go on to devastate France and began a dreadful period in human history. Edward III would invade and burn everything in his path, with hired mercenaries killing, stealing, and attacking women in every village they invaded. But the true horror hit Europe in 1347 when the Black Death, caused by bacteria that spread through fleas, began to ravage major cities indiscriminately. By the end of 1353, the Black Death would become the most fatal pandemic in human history, killing almost half of Europe's population. The area in which Joan was born still encountered deadly outbreaks every few decades. The following years would see the Hundred Years' War continue to rage intermittently, with England striking blow after blow to the French. The misery of this conflict began to sow deep division within the French, with some wanting desperately to end the war, and some wanting desperately to get revenge on the English. These divisions would deepen for the rest of the 14th century. And in 1415, the English King Henry V took advantage of the situation, seeing a chance to end the war once and for all. He would invade France, hoping to conquer it entirely. Only a few months later, on October 15, 1415, at the Battle of Agincourt, the French suffered a catastrophic defeat. According to one historian, the French death roll read like a roll call of military and political leaders and led to entire families of nobility being wiped out. This battle would lead the French king, Charles VI, to suffer a mental collapse. His queen, Isabel of Bavaria, and his uncle, John the Fearless, knew a deal had to be struck. On the 21st of May, 1420, they signed the Treaty of Troyes with the English king. The treaty disinherited the son of Charles VI and instead promised to join dynasties with the English king in hopes of finally ending the Hundred Years' War. For those that were able to live through this harrowing period of war and plague, death had become such a common thing and happened to so many people around them that just being alive and being able to have a family was a blessing in itself. Somehow, the town of Don Huemi, where Joan lived, had remained relatively peaceful during the decades of the war, tucked away on the eastern border of France. But in 1425, England invaded Don Huemi and took its castle. Joan was just 13 at the time, and she was terrified of what the English and their mercenaries would do to her. She had heard story after story of their cruelty. She ran into her garden in fear and heard the church bells ringing. It was at this moment that her life changed forever. She would later testify in court 
that when those church bells rang that day, an angel, who she recognized as St. Michael, appeared in her garden in all his awesome glory. According to Joan, St. Michael, seen as a defender of Don Remy, made Joan swear to remain a virgin and defend France. Still just a young girl, scared for her life, she pleaded to the angel to take her with him. She felt she could no longer bear the burden of the war that had ravaged her country for so long. When St. Michael disappeared without her, she wept bitterly. But then she remembered that when she was a child, a prophecy had spread around France that an armed virgin carrying the banner of France had been foretold to end their country's suffering. It was here that Joan the child became Joan the maiden, and she was determined to keep her vow. By 1428, most of Northern and parts of Southwest France had fallen to the English conquest, including Paris, and most notably the city of Reims, where French kings were traditionally crowned. In July of that same year, the English began to march on Orléans, which was essentially their final obstacle. Its location was at a strategic choke point, the gateway to central France. If Orléans fell, the English would have free reign to assault the rest of Charles VI's territory. The siege of Orléans would begin on the 12th of October, and everyone involved knew the stakes. Now, many in France, including Joan, still firmly believed that Charles, the Dauphin of France, should be their next king. This is the son of the Mad King who had been disinherited by the Treaty of Troyes in 1420. Joan was still in Don Remy and had been trying to continue her normal life since her first vision in 1425. Over the next three years, she continued to hear voices intermittently, which told her she was destined to save France, but they hadn't given her any specific instructions. However, in 1428, her visions turned into explicit instructions, telling Joan she must leave her village immediately and find the Dauphin the rightful heir to France. Guided by these visions, Joan and her uncle would travel to Vaucouleurs, the location of a French garrison. It was here that a 17-year-old girl claiming religious visions stood in front of the French soldiers and requested an armed escort to the Armagnac court, where the Dauphin was currently gathering support. She was essentially laughed out of the room. Joan would be sent back to Don Remy. She had no real plan for how to convince the people in power to help her help them. However, her faith wasn't shaken. The visions had told her that she would see Charles crowned, and she believed them earnestly. Not long after she arrived back home, her village was once again raided by Anglo-Burgundian forces. Crops were destroyed and the soldiers had set fire to the town. In the wake of the destruction, Joan and her family were forced to flee to survive. Returning to Vaucouleurs, Joan was adamant, telling them that she was the savior of France and demanding to be taken to the Dauphin. Once again, she was refused, but this time, something about her determination struck the soldiers and some of the French noblemen. They could tell that she wholeheartedly believed what she was telling them, and they grew to believe her as well. In February of 1429, the garrison commander Robert de Baudrigore, hearing of Joan's growing support, finally agreed to meet with her. No one knows what she said to him during this meeting, but it only took this one conversation for him to be convinced. He immediately sent Joan with an escort of six soldiers to the Armagnac court in Chinon. According to legend, when she arrived in Chinon, the Dauphin was hidden amongst his men for security. Joan, who had never seen him before, walked directly up to him, bent down on one knee, and pledged allegiance to her rightful king. Joan would tell Charles that God recognized him as the true king, and that she was here to lead him to victory and crown him King Charles VII. 
This meeting naturally left a huge impression on Charles, but he wanted to be sure that she was the savior that she claimed to be. He wanted Joan to prove that she was sent by God. Joan simply replied, it will be given if you send me to Orléans. Charles would commission a plate of armor made specially for Joan and did just as she requested. On April 29, 1429, Joan arrived in Orléans. The story of the armed virgin, claiming to be the savior of France, had already spread far and wide. And when Joan entered the city, she was greeted by cheering crowds. But she wasn't just a figurehead raising morale. She was also determined to win the soldiers' respect. Wherever the fighting was the worst, Joan was there, on the front lines, fighting with them. Even the commanders began to listen to her, letting her give them advice on when and where to attack. Remember, this is a young woman who had been raised to spin cloth, tend sheep, and attend mass. She had no combat experience, but she had an unshakable belief in a unified France. On May 4th, the Armagnac army decided to go on the offensive, attacking the English forces head on. Like many times before, the English army simply began to drive them back. A retreat was called, and the French were on the verge of yet another loss. But just as this retreat began, there was Joan the Maiden, sword in hand. The sight of her reminded them that God was on their side. The French turned around and attacked again, and this time they succeeded. The very next day, Joan sent the English a letter warning them to leave France immediately. The English refused to listen, but the Armagnacs had hope that they hadn't felt in years. They were so inspired by their recent victory that they attacked yet again with Joan by their side. And it finally started a much needed winning streak. On May 6, the French captured the town of Saint Jean le Blanc and Joan convinced them to just keep on going. The very next day, they marched on Les Tourelles, the main English stronghold. Joan was feeling unstoppable. Holding her banner up high, she watched as the French forces overran the stronghold and saw the English beginning to retreat. But at that very moment, she was shot in the neck. An arrow in the neck was almost always a fatal injury but not for Joan. She stayed on the battlefield to watch the French achieve their victory. And miraculously, the arrow that she had taken in the neck turned out only to be a minor wound. Send me to Orléans and proof of my claim will be given. On May 8th, the siege of Orléans was abandoned by the English, only nine days after Joan had arrived. France was saved. The sign was undeniable, and Joan had proven herself to everyone. Over the next two months, Joan's confidence in her mission and aggressive attitude towards the English would inspire France's forces to victory after victory. On July 16, 1429, Rheims opened its gates to the French forces led by Joan. The very next morning, Joan stood next to the Dauphin, and watched as Charles was crowned King of France. Joan the Maiden, impossible as it may have seemed, had actually fulfilled a promise that she had made to God. During her mission, she had transformed herself from a girl in a small village to one of the most influential and inspirational people in France. Now, she was determined to defeat the English outright and free her country from their threat once and for all. The Armagnac army would take two weeks to celebrate Charles' coronation, but then they began their march across France once again. As they marched, they were, almost suspiciously, met with nearly zero opposition from either the English or the French faction allied with them, called the Burgundians. In September, Joan's forces arrived in Paris and began their assault, expecting an easy victory. But this time, the enemy was ready. 
Right from the start, things began to go wrong. Early in the battle, Joan was shot in the leg and trapped in a trench near the city walls. Still, she refused to be taken off the front lines, staying with the men who were still fighting for their lives. By the end of the day, 1,500 Armagnacs had died, to no avail. The next morning, Charles would call off the attack to the outrage of Joan. Now, many of the people in Charles' court were beginning to see Joan as a liability. Although she had become very popular, she was seen as too aggressive, too independent, and too selfish to be trusted. Although he was hesitant at first, Charles slowly began to see that her influence was getting in the way of peace with England and the Burgundians. But he still recognized that Joan had been an inspiration to his troops and was a major reason why he had taken back his crown from the English in the first place. As a thank you, Charles would raise Joan and her family to French nobility. But after this, it became evident that the French court no longer had need for her. Charles VII began peace talks with the Burgundians and agreed on a truce that would last until Easter of 1430. Joan was noticeably absent from the negotiations. She was convinced that only aggression against the Burgundians would keep the English at bay. And on May 23, 1430, she attacked a Burgundian camp outside of a city called Compigny. But her forces were overwhelmed in an ambush, and she was captured. Although allied with the English, the Burgundians knew how valuable Joan was as a hostage, and they would only release her to the English for the steep ransom of 10,000 livres. Knowing that Joan had become an unstoppable figurehead for the Armagnacs, the source of all of their hope, the English were happy to pay the price. Joan was transferred into English custody in November of 1430. The English knew that they had to get rid of her, but they needed charges. So they began interrogations for heresy and essentially witchcraft. Over the course of many weeks of questioning, Joan admitted to hearing voices, but she was steadfast, saying they came from God, the same God that the English worshipped, and not the devil. She was also accused of wearing men's clothing, which was considered against the natural order set by God. At her trial, Joan had to respond to over 70 charges against her. It was, of course, not a fair proceeding. Nearly all of those responsible for her verdict were pro-English or pro-Burgundian. Facing the threat of immediate execution by burning, the terrified Joan signed an abjuration, essentially admitting to her supposed crimes. She would henceforth be banned from wearing men's clothes or bearing arms ever again, and would remain in prison. If she were ever found to have relapsed as a heretic, her punishment would be severe. She was returned to prison and kept in horrible conditions. But most of all, Joan was wrecked by guilt. She had renounced the one thing that she believed in, her visions from God. Over the next seven days, she regained her courage, and once again donning male attire, she withdrew her confession. On May 30th, 1431, Joan was told that she faced a heretic's execution. She was taken to the public square and publicly read her sentence of condemnation. Before her hands were tied up, she pleaded for a cross to hold. An English soldier, moved by her words, quickly handed her a small wooden crucifix. In her final moments, Joan, aged only 19, kissed the cross and placed it on her chest. Although she was not alive to see it, Joan of Arc undoubtedly changed France's fate in the Hundred Years' War. The English would never again regain their momentum. And in 1453, the French finally expelled the English, with a victory at the Battle of Castillon, fulfilling Joan's promise of a unified France. Nearly 20 years after her death, Charles VII ordered an inquiry into the trial of Joan of Arc and at a restoration trial, her guilty verdict was overturned. Joan has gone on to become a powerful symbol for unity in France. 
In 1920, she was canonized as a saint and has inspired millions of women with her confidence and self-belief. Joan's life is a true testament that we are all created equal and can all rise to the greatness within us. So let's talk about Joan's appearance and reveal our recreations. What Joan really looked like is almost entirely a mystery. In fact, this doodle in the margins of French parliamentary notes is the only image that exists from her lifetime and was sketched by someone who had not even seen her in person. There is also this statue head from a church in Orléans. The statue dates to the 15th century and given Joan's association with the city and the feminine appearance, this led historians to believe this might be a depiction of her or perhaps the image of a saint using Joan herself as a model. However, in more recent years, this has been nearly debunked and is now believed to belong to a full statue of St. George. The statue head was clearly an influence for this full-length statue of Joan of Arc in the Rheim Cathedral, created in 1910. So this kind of template is still strongly associated with her appearance. Luckily, we do have quite a few physical descriptions to guide us with a possible reconstruction. We know that she was short, probably around 5'2", and very muscular with a strong, thick neck. Multiple accounts say she had really dark hair, and she cropped it short with bangs, similar to the men's hairstyles at the time. Her eyes were described as large, dark, and grave, and matched her skin tone, which was tan and usually sunburned from her time outdoors. She also had a small red birthmark visible behind one of her ears. In 1844, a letter was discovered, written by Joan in 1429. Within the wax seal was a single black hair, pressed in by the tip of a finger. It is believed that this may have been the fingerprint and hair of Joan herself, stemming from a custom where a letter writer would pluck a hair from their head to guarantee authenticity. The letter still remains, but sadly, the seal has since been lost. Percival de Boulanvier wrote a long account about Joan to his king, Charles VII. He said, the maid is of satisfying grace and in her conversation displays wondrous good sense. Her voice has a womanly charm. She eats little and delights in beautiful horses and armor and greatly admires armed and noble men. She sheds tears freely, her expression is cheerful, and she has a great capacity for work. Of such endurance is her handling and bearing of arms that she remained for six days and nights in full armor. So in terms of the recreation, this is mostly an artistic depiction, but I've used contemporary descriptions of Joan, as well as some influence from the statue head to bring you what she might have looked like. So let's take a look at Joan of Arc now. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you all for the next video.